together. So with that being said, if you could turn with me in your Bible to the, the uh, Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. As we take a look at this beautiful chapter. And what I'd like us to do is I'm going to read the chapter. And then we're going to go back to, at it. We're going to do it a little bit different tonight. And then we're going to take a look at some interesting things in chapter 9 and 10. It opens up, we read, when, the, when these things were done, the princes, came, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. So the holy seed had mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, and hands and the hand of the princesses and the rulers have been, have been chief in the, this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair off my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. And then were assembled unto me every, every one that trembled at the word of God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had carried away. And I sat astonished until evening time, or till the evening sacrifice. Verse 3 talks about something that's so amazing about Israel. And of course, the story that we're seeing is when he went back into the land, and he was a part of the first wave that went back to rebuild the temple, and he was the second wave. He, he stayed back, and there were some 2,000 people that went with Ezra, went back there, hoping to find, you know, really a nation that was so moved by God and what they were doing that they would, he would go back there and just enter into fellowship with the believers there. But instead, what do we, what do we find? We find them once again going back to the practices that got them in such trouble in the first place. In verse 3, I love it where it says, And when I heard these things, I rent my garment, my mantles, and pluck off the hair of my head and of my beard, and I sat down astonished. What, a little bit of dramatic there, isn't it? But really, I think he was overwhelmed what he saw. Over in Ezekiel chapter 22, the prophet Ezekiel was a prophet to the Jews that was the, who were exiled to Babylon. The Lord said in Ezekiel chapter 22, starting in verse um, 29, the reason why they went into captivity. He says the people of the land uh, had, uh, had used oppression. They committed robbery and took advantage of the poor and the needy. They oppressed the strangers wrongfully. The Lord said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedges and stand in the gap before me in the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, says the Lord God. God was looking for a man to stand against the evil that was going on in the land. And he found none. Thus, judgment came to the nation. See, we know in the Bible, as we study the scriptures, that God is first of all kind. And we know in the Bible that God is compassionate. And he's, he's a gracious God. He's slow to anger and plentiness and mercy. In fact, Peter tells us in his epistle, the reason why the Lord has not yet returned is the fact that God is what? He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that they all should come to repentance. Again, in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, God told Ezekiel, Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I desire that the wicked would turn from his wickedness and live. And then he goes on and he says, Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of what? O house of Israel. Israel was in a place where 
they had moved from God. They were, became very self-righteous in their thoughts that they were the chosen people. And God was extending mercy to them, and God was extending long-suffering. And so often we get that kind of mixed up in our mind. People often misinterpret the long-suffering as God, that God is just simply ignoring them and allowing things to happen. In, Psalm, in the book of Psalm, chapter 94, verse 8, the psalm says, The fool, fools, when will you become wise? He that has taught knowledge, does he not know? He who has created ears, does he, do you think that he is death? Do you think the one who created your eyes cannot see? In Psalm 139, as David said, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know, when we think that God just doesn't see the actions that are going on, we sometimes have this false idea that God either doesn't care or that God can't see I'm getting away from it with sin. You know, and I think that's so wrong for us to do. We misinterpret the mercies of God as approval. Nowadays in Christianity, there's this group called the liberal Christians. Or they're, they're tagged as another way. They even like the title. It's called progressive Christians. Progressive in their theology. Progressive in their thinking. And, and they kind of start thinking that it's okay because God hasn't judged me. I can go along with my thinking. And, and there's Christians or so-called clergymen that are going along with the CR 99 that's up there in the state legislation even right this day where they're trying to change the laws where me as a pastor, I cannot coach or I cannot speak to anybody that has some different sexual preference because they will call, call that what I'm doing is I'm giving conversion therapy. I'm trying to coach them along, and they want to outlaw that. They want to outlaw our privilege. And the progressive Christians and liberal Christians and say, yeah, that's right. Why should we? We need to let little, let, let little. <laughs> I'm trying almost say, there you go. You got to care of what I should be saying. You know, but that's what they're doing, and that's what they were doing back then. They're twisting the logic of scriptures. They're t twisting God's word and, and figure that he, God must be approving our evil. God must be approving our ways because he hasn't judged us yet. That's exactly what was happening to the nation of Israel. We're the chosen people, so thus God must not be judging us. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in uh, the chapter 5, verse 5. He says, now know this. The no whoremonger, no sexual impure pure person, no covetous man, no idolatry will have an, any inheritance with the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, the wrath of God has uh, come upon the children of disobedient. Ministers today are really putting out vain words if God is displeased with me, he would send judgment upon me. God can't be displeased with me. Look at the size of my church and as we continue to grow. But yet they're moving away from God, what he has for us to say, to say to us through his word. God had been merciful to Israel. He has delivered them from captivity. They've been in Babylon underneath bondage. Once again, he delivered them. He allowed them to return to their homeland. However, it didn't take very long for, until they were back to their own old sin for the very sin that caused them to go into captivity in the first place. They're back doing again. Ezra, a godly man in our story, purpose in his heart to seek the Lord. He's been commissioned of the king of Persia to return to Jerusalem to offer up sacrifice unto the God and to govern the people. When he arrives, as I mentioned, instead of following people that were seeking the Lord, now he's find, finding men and women of the Jews when they left. They started intermarrying with the, the people of the land, as we saw there in chapter, verse 4. Now they were marrying the heathen nations around them. Ezra reacts by tearing his clothes off, his mantle, pulled out his hair, 
pulled out his beard, and he sat down the whole day. I think God today is looking for men like Ezra, women like Ezra, who are willing to be passionate against evil, willing to stand up when they see it and say, well, it's okay, everybody's doing it. Really to stand up and not to be tolerant of such a day. We're living in a day which is accepted of toleration is the rule of the day. People say that we should live and let live. It's interesting to me that the most intolerant people in society are those who are advocate, advocating toleration. Through the media of the day, through all the media that we're seeing, we're, I think, swiftly being indoctrinated in, against the reaction of evil. Look, at, well, you don't have to look at your TV. You're all aware of what they're trying to shove at us each and every day. God's man is a man. God's woman is a man who's shocked by evil and other passions and react to it. If you have a, ta- a chance and you want to hear an amazing message I heard this week as I was preparing to Ezra chapter 9, and that's why I took a pause out of what we normally do on Sunday night, by a man named Pastor Chuck Smith. You can go on the phone app. You can go to pastorchuck.org and, and listen to his message out of uh, Ezra chapter 9. As he talked about how wicked the society, the Christian church had become, where we were all going in the fl- flock into a movie called The Temptation of Christ that Universal Pictures put out many years ago. It was the most vile thing that anybody could put out in, in the name of Jesus. And they were trying to get all of us to, to take it in and to accept it as being right. I would to God that we would be like Ezra did. And he tells us that he went and sat down. And Ezra was a desperate man in prayer. Ezra knew that's what the Lord would have us to do, is that we would pray. Jesus warned of the days that would precede his coming. And I want to look at this one verse before we go back to the rest of the verses in chapter 9 and 10. In Luke chapter 21, he said, Take heed to yourself. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the disciples. Take heed to yourself, lest at least at any time your heart be overcharged with, with and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that the day, that, so that day finds you unprepared. For as a snare, uh, a snare shall it come on all them that dwell upon the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore and pray when, pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Yes, God is gracious. God is kind. God is very long-suffering. But this, to, to dismiss that his return is not intimate, re, to dismiss that we can live in, as we want to live, is going contrary to the word of God. As you go on now, as they were assembled together, and they sat astonished until evening time, in verse 5, and he says, At an evening sacrifice I rose up, from my heaviness, having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And this is what he prayed. And I said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to, unto thee, uh, to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto heaven. A lot of times you see the prayers of the Bible from Daniel and, and, and Paul and so many where they include themselves in it. Ezra saw that here. We as a nation, he's not pointing his finger at them because he realized that not only does he need to intercede for the nation, but he needs the grace of God to be upon his life too. And in verse 7, he says, Since the days of our fathers have we been... Have we been a great in a great trespass unto this days. Otherwise, this is not new. You know, there's a great idea, of, certainly amongst the Jews, that you know the, we're the fathers of Abraham, you know Jacob, 
We had this national pride that we we're somebody, but here what we're seeing Ezra saying is that, hey, all of our fathers blew it. Go back and study it as we went through. Did Abraham have a few problems when he was Abram? Absolutely. You go right on down the line. He says, where we all had iniquity, we have, we have we, our kings, David, and our priests. Oh, my goodness, yes. Been delivered into the hands of the kings of this land to the sword of the captivity and to the spoils and to the confusion of faith. It, it, is, it is this day. He says, that's what sin always brings. Sin ultimately will bring confusion. It won't allow you to walk in, in that rightness before God. It brings disorder to your life. And now for a little space in verse 8, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a, remem a remnant to escape and to give us a nail, nail in this holy place that our God might lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. He says, even though we're, we've all rebelled against us, Lord, you've been gracious to us. You've been long-suffering to us, and you've given us this little spot. There's a little time of revival. For we were bondmen, in verse 9, talked about his captivity, yet our God had not forsaken us in our bondage. Is this the first time? No. Down there in Egypt. How many years? 400 years. God never forgot them. And I think it's important for us to realize that as believers, what we're going through, that we remember that God never forgets us. He never ever lose sight of what you're going through. He's there to help you. He will answer your prayers and he will take care of you. And he goes on, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the king of Persia, and give us a, gave us a, 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 re, a, a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolation there, thereof, and give us a, us a wall in Judah in Jerusalem. If you, if you remember what he's talking about reviving us, go back and read the previous chapter, chapter 8, how, uh, well, actually chapter 7 and 8, how Artaxerxes took off all of his wealth, everything that they had taken when Nebuchadnezzar went into the land and took all the spoils back to Babylon. Not only he gave everything back to them, but he also took out of his own pockets and gave it to them. And he says, make sure you guys have enough money to take everything and take care of everything. And here, as was praying, he said, man, you gave us exceedingly abundantly what we could ever ask or think. That's how God works. Do you believe in this God, that he gives you exceedingly abundantly? And you know, I'm amazed how good God is to my life and to my wife's life. And, uh, you know, I, I just got a small example. It's sitting right out front here. It's our blue truck. My truck was about ready to break down. I get in a little accident, and I'm hoping just to get a replacement that kind of looks like it, you know, kind of old beat-up truck. I'd be happy with it. I just look, want something to go down the road. And the Lord gave me a truck that I would never, ever think about buying. But doesn't he do that in our life, gives us things that are, goes beyond us? He just wants us to trust him. He wants us to ask. In verse 10, And now, oh, oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. I think he was brokenhearted at this point. Which, the, which thou hast commanded uh, by thy servants, the prophets, saying, The land unto which you go to possess it, it, it is unclean land with the filthiness of the people, the lands with the abominations which we, which we have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. There, now, therefore, give not your daughters unto thy sons, neither take thy daughters unto your, own, uh, your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that you may be strong and eat good of the land and leave it for an inheritance uh, to your children forever. When I look at these verses, uh, you, you sometimes wonder, why did a nation rebel? What caused them to sin? Maybe they started looking at the people that from the 
Amorites and the ones that we lo looked at there in verse number uh, one at the end of it, the Moabites, the Jebusites, maybe they start to become envious of what they had. The, the way they were living their lives, but something drew them to them rather than to the word of God. Today, as men and women, as they fall into sin and they go away from the, the goodness of God, it's almost like it uh, tells us later about Moses, where Moses didn't want to enjoy sin for a season, right? He says, what's the advantage if you enjoy it just for a moment and then you, you live in a, you, you reap the the result of it is being in corruption. And then as he goes on, he says, and after all that has come, in verse 13, upon all these evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, God, has, has punished us, let the, less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us uh, such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments and join... Uh, the, and if any with the people of those abominations, would not that thou be angry with us until has, that thou has consumed us? So there shall be no more remedy nor escaping. For the Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous. For we remain yet, yet escaped. That is this day, behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. Very true statement that he's saying there. He says, you're holy. You're a holy God and you're consuming fire. And how can we stand there in our sins and in our rebellion? And quite frankly, no man can stand in front of the presence of the Lord in and of himself. And that's why exactly, you know, a little over 400 and something years later, uh, <laughs> We get introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ when he comes into the land because the nation, after the final book of the Old Testament with Malachi, we got those 400 years of silence. We almost think that, well, maybe God's all done with the nation. Maybe all God's all done with the world. But yet the promise of hope is saying, God says, I knew they couldn't do it. And that's why they needed a, a savior. That's why every man realize and every woman realized we need Jesus for that forgiveness as he went to the cross for all of us and he says I, for yet remain yet escape as it is this day behold we are before thee in our trespass for we cannot stand before thee because of this nobody could stand because of our sin but yet because of Jesus because of the cross of Calvary the Bible tells us that you and I, not only we could stand before God, but he welcomes you each and every day that you can come boldly before the throne of grace. Can you imagine that? That God knows who you are. He knows who I am with all my shortcoming, and he welcomes me to the throne of grace to find mercy, to find help in the time of need that we could come at any time. Oh, the grace of God, the love of God. At verse 1, Now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, notice, weeping, and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very, a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. I think they must have seen the sincerity of Ezra, Maybe they were, had remembered how great God is and, and that, you know, a fire started happening. You know, that old song only takes a spark to get the fire going. Maybe Ezra was that spark to remind people and you guys can be that spark too is to remind himself, other people around you of, of God's grace and the wonder of God. And as they went on, as as that, uh, um, Shennacherib, the son of Jael, the son of Elam, answered and said to Ezra, We have uh, trespassed against God and have taken strange wives uh, of the people of the land. Yet now uh, there is hope in Israel concerning these things. Remember, the reason why they 
you know, God had restricted them from taking these strange wives is because what they would bring into the, into the nation of Israel is these ungodly behaviors as they would start worshiping these false gods. And here was set up in order to protect them from that influence that they would bring into their home. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with God to put away all the wives such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord, those that tremble at the commandment of, of our God. Let it be done according to thy law. Arise, for this manner belongeth unto thee. We also will, uh, will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. And that's the hard part, isn't it? They can go, it's almost like they're having a revival meeting right now. Maybe Ezra's like having a great, uh, you know, guest speaker come to the church. Everybody gets revved up. You know, we're going to put away our strange wives. We're going to go back to the word of God. And, you know, and then it says, and then it goes on as far, far as concerning this matter. Okay, we're going to do this and we're going to be, be of good courage. And then we're going to do it. That doing is tested over a period of time. As it's laid out in front of you, are we going to still be following and seeking the Lord when Monday comes, when Tuesday comes, a week from now, a month from now? Is our commitment shallow or is our commitment going to be, no matter what comes our way, are we still going to be serving the Lord? And we know the story with the children of Israel. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests of the Levites and all of Israel to swear that they should do according to the word, and they swear. I, I just think it's so bold of Ezra. He realized the problem had started where? It started in the household of God. It started with their leadership. It started with their priests, that they weren't walking clean and holy before the Lord. And so he told them, say, okay, boys, you want to be the leaders. You want to be the priests. You come here and make a commitment that you're going to serve the Lord. And I tell you, what a great message that would be to all pastors across the land. And I'm one of the pastors, too, that we would make a commitment to holiness. We would make a commitment to God's word, to follow it, and to listen to what God had to say. And so he made them swear to do this. Then I wrote, Ezra rode up from before the house of God and went into the chambers of, uh, of Johanab, the son of Elishabab. And when he had came thither, he did not eat, eat no bread, nor drink no water, uh, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had, had made had been carried away. The transgression brought him to prayer. Brought him to a place where he humbled himself. He tore off, his, ripped his hair out of his hair, his beard. And now it brings us to mourning. That we would be grieved for the sin of our nation. That we would be grieved for the sin of the church. And they made proclamations throughout Judah and Jerusalem and all the children of the captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And that whosoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the priests and the elders and all the substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that have been carried away. So now when you, what you're talking about is the outlying area. Not right there in Jerusalem, but the people who are living on the outside, they had been receiving funding from all the way back from Artaxerxes. He says, you need, guys need to come and hear this. Otherwise, your money is going to be cut off. Right, Ezra is pretty smart there, right? You hit a man in his wallet, sometimes he'll wake up and he'll come running at this point. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. And it was the ninth month of the twelfth day of the month. And all the people sat in the streets of the house of God, trembling because of this manner and for, for, the, great, for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said to him, You have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make a co confession unto the Lord your God and your fathers and do, and do his pleasure and separate yourself from the people of the land and from the strange wife. You know, as he was saying, he says, 
you have increased the uh, trespass of, of Israel by taking these strange wives. It wasn't that they weren't sinning. It wasn't that they were not rebellion. This just showed how much more that they were in that state of rebellion. And I love that phrase, to do his pleasure. Isn't that kind of a good model to live by this week? Is to seek to do things that are pleasing to the Lord. Is to do his pleasure. Then all the congregation in verse 12 answered and said, With a loud voice, and thou hast said, so must we do. But the people, people and many, it is time for much rain, and we are not able to stand without neither as its work of uh, work of our day or our two, for we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Let us now, our rulers and all the congregation, stand, and let all them that have taken strange wife in our cities come at, at appointed times with them that. Uh, of the elders until the fierce wrath of God for the matter be turned away from us. And so as we see, we see this confession that's going on it, as you go all the way down it, into verse number 18. I'll re let you read through those other names. And it says, as we hear, it gives us a list of the repentant family heads as you go through. It, it says, among the sons of the priests that were found in the uh, that has taken strange wives, namely, and he goes down and lists them. But what I wanted to uh, point out was among the sons of the priests that were really leading the way. I, I don't know what happens when uh, people within the church, within, uh, you know, at this time, they weren't reading God's word. They would look at what Deuteronomy had to say, what Leviticus had to say, as I opened up. Maybe they thought that no judgment was coming. It's okay. Maybe God winked at us, and we could just continue living our lives the way we are. But finally, Ezra called him on him and says, the judgment is going to come. As you go through, and you can read all this, in verse 44, as we finish up at the book of Ezra, all these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Sin does never ever affect one person, does it? It affects families and it affects communities. Would to God that we would live for him each and every day, that we would seek to do his pleasure. And if we find ourselves in rebellion, that we would simply repent. That's what the Bible has always called us to do, is to turn you, turn you unto the Lord. That's what we saw there in Ezekiel, that we would turn back to the Lord. And if we find ourselves in a place when we have rebellion, rebellion in our hearts, that we would confess it to the Father. Because the Bible tells us that we as believers, we have an advocate with the Father. And what's his name? Jesus Christ the righteous that's ever making intercession for us because God saw and he saw them that they needed help so in his plan he decided to send Jesus to be that redeemer and I'm so glad that he, he did as I see this book as we come to the end you're kind of like oh you mean that's it no it's not it wait till next week as we start the book of Nehemiah as we see the work continue, as we make our journey through the Old Testament. We are marching towards the New Testament. It might take us another year or two. The Lord tarries, but we're making our way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then Rhea close us in a song of prayer. We want to thank you for joining us for this evening's Bible study. For more information, you can visit the church website at www agapechapeloc.org or else you can email us at info at agapechapeloc.org It's our desire that all of us would grow together in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Until next time, may God richly bless you.